I am Mick Morris of Lurwick. I work in the crab processing plant where I wear hygienic protective clothing. Everybody in this town wears brightly coloured functional clothes. Most of the jobs here have something to do with either fishing or oil. The equipment is also painted in primaries and fluorescents. Orange, pink, yellow, bright green. It almost makes up for the lack of light, the bleakness, blackness and whiteness of everything here. Another thing that compensates, of course, is the aurora borealis. Even the sky seems to wear fluorescent safety gear. The commodity that makes this lurid, sparse, functional town possible is crabs. Not just any crab, but the world's largest, the Kamchatka. They aren't native to our seas. Joseph Stalin introduced them from the Pacific to the Barents Sea in 1930 to help feed the hundreds of thousands of people he was sending to Siberia at the time. Originally a source of basic protein for prisoners and exiles, the Kamchatka crab is now a premium-priced luxury product. The crab is also a bit of an environmental hazard. These pinky-white skeletal arachnids, which span up to six feet, hobble along the bottom of the ocean, devouring every living thing in their path. For some time, they've been spreading west at the rate of about 20 kilometres a day, clawing their way around the coast of Norway and down towards the North Sea. And now they're here in Shetland. All of this sounds fairly intentional, but the creatures don't even have a central brain. Like cockroaches, they have bits of low intelligence distributed across their nervous systems, at the tops of their legs, for instance. They're unloaded from the Russian and Norwegian fishing, fishing vessels alive and killed in the processing plant by being chopped in two right down the hard shell of the back. The nervous system just fizzles and stops. That's where my job begins. I assess the various parts for meat quality and grade them. Then other employees chop them, wash them, pack them and box up packs in 20s and 40s. 70% 70 of what we process here goes to Japan. I'm essentially fed, housed and clothed by the Japanese economy. That's what got me interested in Japan, in fact. Japan has become my hobby and my dream. After work, I climb the icy, gritty permafrost path that leads away from the flat industrial quayside to my small house, clad in red metal panels. I watch the late flight descending into Skatska Airport as I fumble for my key with big, orange-gloved hands. I remove my moon boots, take off my thermal suit, click on the television, drop an NHK Kabuki video into the player, take a shower, crack open a beer and head to the kitchen freezer to select a pack of fish for dinner. As I slide the pale frozen block out of its plastic wrapping, I watch through my window the lights of a square-windowed Russian ship slotting into position under pink cranes down on the dock. The Kabuki DVD stops and I switch on the local news. At Muckle Row, a rocky treeless island on the west coast of our archipelago, 12 local men have been accused of tampering with, or climbing into, calving cows. The men have a strange excuse. By entering recently vacated bovine wombs, they say, they have been able twelve times to visit the future of Japan. Now Terence McCulpin, the editor of the Shetland Gazette, is being interviewed. The men have invented a foolish and far-fetched alibi for a dirty and evil crime, he says. McCulpin brands them the idiots. 2. The weather warms up a bit. A new selection of DVDs arrives from Amazon Japan, brightening up my life. And then, a couple of weeks after the report about the cow-crawling idiots, there's a follow-up. There's been a big earthquake in Tokyo. Even people who don't care much about Japan are talking about it at work, how it might affect the world economy. Anyway, someone, somehow, uh, one of our Shetland idiots, managed to predict it. The precise date, the hour, and Richter magnitude in a statement recorded by the Shetland police. The prosecution of a presumed syndicate of bestials has been abandoned and a symposium of inquiry set up in Lerwick. Its premise is that the idiots might really have seen the future of Japan. Twelve investigators have been selected for their deep knowledge of Japan and flown to Shetland. The idiots will tell their tales and the experts will triangulate what they hear with known facts about Japan. If it turns out that the idiots really have visited Japan, the symposium can begin to tease out crucial facts not just about the future of an important nation in the Far East, but of life on this planet. 
Regrettably, one of the experts has had to cancel. And remarkably, incredibly, I have been selected as a last-minute replacement. I am widely known as the biggest Japanophile in all of the Shetland Isles. Possibly they wanted a lay presence on the panel. It probably helped that I knew some of the idiots personally. Sure, the idiots may be unreliable and uneducated witnesses, but if there's even a slim chance that these men have indeed managed to visit the future, we owe it to ourselves and to humanity to draw as much information as we can from them. I am totally honoured. I have exchanged my lurid boiler suit for a suit and tie. The crabs can wait. These pages are my own personal notes, compiled in the Lerwick boathouse that was commandeered for the inquiry. I'm keeping this personal record in case the official report, when it appears, fudges the facts. I'm determined that there will be no cover-up. Chapter 3 The premises where the symposium takes place are reached by way of an unprepossessing red door concealed between Malakoff ship chandlers and Carpet Kingdom, just off Lerbeck's commercial road. At the end of a long, narrow, sloping corridor, you suddenly reach an elegant industrial shed lit by skylights which are at their best when they catch the evening sun. Carpet Kingdom has supplied a number of whorled axminsters to soften the boathouse's severe acoustics. The deep red foliated carpets don't just cover the floor but hang on the walls too, giving the place the snug feel of a Mongolian yurt. Boats in various stages of construction still hang from the ceiling by chains, obliging us to duck sometimes as we move around the room. I am introduced to the experts and the idiots, and given a piece of paper on which their names are written. The twelve idiots are Ian Scalloway, 27, farmhand. Glenn Hitchardson, 55, farmer. Brian Garvey, 18, Chandler. Malcolm Moore, 20, oil refinery worker. Fergus Top, 29, veterinarian's assistant. Simon Campbell, 37, newsagent and tobacconist. George Henry, 47, unemployed. Dionysius Ralph, 16, schoolboy. David Byrne, 78, retired fisherman. Gabriel Lewis, 49, veterinarian. Donald Donaldson, 25, shortwave radio enthusiast and engineer. Tamberlane Gardner, 60, retired miner suffering from asbestosis. The 12 Japan experts are Dr. Philip Secunda, 59, public intellectual and noted for his writings on Japanese culture. Bryce Harvey, 86, veteran commentator on Japanese film. Mervyn Olds, 88, eminent Japan studies scholar, writer, translator and interpreter. Declan Singleton, 62, market analyst and Japan consultant. Jim Kerr, 48, Japaniclast and nippophobe. Shinobu Stuarto, 45, rights activist and tenured conspiracy theorist. Leslie Slot, 35, psychoanalyst and design enthusiast. Tadanobu Mutainai, 38, historian. Hirohisa Matsumiya, 45, architect. David Caravan, 56, Showa expert, broadcaster. Brewster Gaines, 70, style guru. And of course myself, Mick Morris, 50, Japanologist, Futurologist and Crap Processor. The 12 de desks of the idiots face the 12 desks of the experts at a remove of one metre. The idiot Tamberlane Gardner faces the expert Brewster Gaines. The idiot Donald Donaldson faces the expert David Caravan. The idiot Gabriel Lewis faces the expert Hirohisa Matsumiya. The idiot Simon Campbell faces the expert Tadanobu Motainai. The idiot Dionysus Ralph faces the expert Leslie Slot. The idiot George Henry faces the expert Shinobu Stuarto. The, the idiot David Byrne faces the expert Jim Kerr. The idiot Fergus Top faces the expert Declan Singleton. The idiot Malcolm Moore faces the expert Mervyn Olds. The idiot Brian Garvey faces the expert Bryce Harvey. The idiot Glenn Hitchison faces the expert Philip Secunda. The idiot Ian Scalloway faces me, the expert Mick Morris. 
There is something strangely intense about this arrangement. Seldom do men of such widely differing backgrounds and such varied levels of intelligence come face to face, except when one is performing some menial service for the other, polishing his shoes, for instance. And yet there is potentially some levelling going on here. The expert's claim to superiority over the idiots is based on our deep knowledge of Japan. But if we establish that the idiots really have visited the future of Japan, they clearly possess a knowledge superior to ours. The roles threaten at any moment to reverse. If the idiots turn out to be experts, we experts will become the new idiots. The water of the Bresse Sound laps at the great double doors that define the room's lowest point. Sea spray lashes the wood. But as we gaze at these doors, the 24 idiots and experts aren't seeing the sea as it fetches up on the Lerwick Harbour walls. We're seeing far to the east, the Far East. 4. I'm introduced to Dr. Secunda. The stiff, thin, cliff-browed old man towers over me. He has a natural authority. His hand in mine feels like the claw of an enfeebled eagle. Secunda explains that our job here will be to listen to the men, he actually calls them idiots, although two or three are within hearing range, and extrapolate from their tales the likelihood that they're telling the truth. The experts will also be making presentations containing facts about present-day Japan. Tales and facts will then be juxtaposed with the aim of seeing whether they can be made to fit. The experts will also be attempting to glean any facts possible about the future not just of Japan but of human life on this planet. If there's anything in any of this, says Secunda, the significance for humanity will be enormous. And if the idiots are lying, I ask? Dr. Secunda's nose becomes a tilted beak as a frown furrows his brows. My brother thinks he's a chicken, he says gravely. We really ought to correct him, but we need the eggs. 5. Before we begin the idiot's uh, evidence, um, hearing the idiot's evidence, the inquiry must mount an important experiment. We need to find out if the experts can be sent to Japan the same way the idiots went. And so we leave the boathouse and a fleet of land rovers. We head in a convoy to the Muckle Row cattle shed where the idiots claim to have travelled to Japan in cows. In the almost horizontal rain, rugged wipers struggle across segmented windscreens and wheels spin on loose red cinders and grit. We zigzag slowly along the path cut into the foothills of the dormant volcano which overshadows Muckle Row. It's called the Big Red Island in Old Norse. At the Donald farm, we struggle out of the Land Rovers and survey the Martian landscape. Harvey and Olds, frail and ancient, are the last to emerge from the dark green vehicles, carrying walking sticks and grumbling about the toxic film of rain the wind is driving into their faces. It's calving season, and the Donald barn is full of prostrate Shetland cows. Some are brindled, some ginger, some black and white. The air is full of grass farts and pain cries. There's blood and shit everywhere. We drink a morale-boosting cup of tea, <coughs> and a farmhand gives us the last minute, uh, a last-minute recap of strategies, logistics, abortion, and safety procedures. At last we change into special orange rubber suits, and each of us struggles into the womb of a birthing cow. The idiots egg us on, shouting encouragement and pushing us deeper into the protesting animals. As I wriggle through the wild pelvis of Strawberry May, the female selected for me, the idiot Lewis, an expert on these animals, informs me that I am doing my cow no harm. <coughs> They're hardy beasts, all right, he shouts. The weaklings of this breed died out long ago. That's Shetland for you. Inside Strawberry May's womb, the heat is unbearable. Fleshy walls press in on me. The air is thick. The hubbub of the idiots grows dim. Soon all I can hear is the bubbling sound of cow innards. On either side, two enormous stomachs chunder with acid, and a staunch cow heart hammers hard overhead. I feel as if I'm inside a tiny jet made of flesh. After a few minutes, I can take no more. Help! Excuse me, it's not working, I shout. I want to get out. Give it a little longer, sir. Lewis and Top are pushing me back in. The hammering chunder grows deafening. No, I, I really must insist you let me out. I'm suffocating. Lewis and Top grab my feet and deliver me back to the straw floor of the cowshed. Did you go to Japan, sir? asks the idiot Top. No, I did not. 
The idiot Lewis shakes his head. Pity, he said. That was our best cow. Chapter 6 On the way back to the boathouse we question the idiot Lewis more closely about his understanding of the mechanics of cow time travel. The islander speaks more like an engineer than a veterinarian. It's my belief, says the idiot Lewis, that there are two sets of what I call trunking wired under these cows' skins, kept apart by an insulator of half-digested vegetable matter. The upper trunking is a general services shaft. The lower one is connected to a technical or clean shaft. This latter shaft allows the cows to discharge seconds, minutes and hours, as well as metres and kilometres, in the least disruptive and least smelly way possible. Lewis certainly sounds as if he knows what he's talking about. Now, he continues, the general services shaft is not, as I understand it, clean enough for the purposes of time travel, so the cow's time sockets have gradually become wired to the clean shaft, with strips of flesh between the mounting bones and the socket to prevent the two shaft systems from shorting each other out. I lean towards Sikanda and whisper to him, it would have been useful to have a technical expert present for this. I believe we do, says Sikanda. Nobody knows the Shetland cow better than the Shetland idiot. Chapter 7 It's the first day of the symposium. The idiot Ian Scalloway is giving his address. Scalloway is a feckless man with a shaved head and an enormous, open-mouthed, acne-blotched face. He has halitosis. In Japan, he says, I was a five-centimetre-tall prince. I was rolling a big adhesive ball around, collecting objects and throwing them up into the sky to replace lost stars. I scribble a note and pass it up to Sikanda. This man has obviously played the computer game Katamari Damacy, it says. Sikanda writes for some time, then passes a complicated note back to me. Morris, in the Tokugawa period, the authorities got very worried about certain vulgar histories, which were said to follow the wind and seize the shadows. These Haishi Shosetsu or Bokan Yashi, were accused of fabricating unsubstantiated events, confusing and misleading readers. They were playthings and amusements at best, at worst defective or dubious historical writings offered as a sort of literary candy for women and children. Official orthodox histories, meanwhile, were known as Seishi, and adhered rigidly to the classical Chinese histories and the writings of Confucius. But the reason the Japanese authorities feared the candy of the vulgar histories is that they offered opportunities for satire and subversion, for alternative interpretations of events. They encouraged their readers to imagine alternative realities. So let us not rush to judgment. Something may come of this. The idiot Ian Scalloway continues. Everything was flat. Society was flat. The landscape was flat and I was flat. It's not as if this world couldn't be in 3D. They'd managed that, they'd done that, but now people in Japan preferred things to be flat. People in Japan believe that limitations are pretty much the same thing as flavour, and flavour is something they love. Whereas we have four types of flavour, sweet, sour, salty and bitter, the Japanese have only one, umami. But this is not a reduction, because umami contains all of our four flavours, plus a quality you might call meaty or savoury or fermented. In the same way, the Japanese have only one season, but it contains all four of our seasons. The Japanese call the season henka, or transition. Sikanda nods at me as if to say, I told you so. The only animal left in Japan is the crow, continues the idiot. But in Japan, the crow comes in more shapes and sizes, more guises and disguises than all the animals in the rest of the world put together. The crows in Japan are as cute as a child and prehistoric. They are Mesozoic crows. But whereas for us the Mesozoic era is just one of three that happened during the geological eon we call Phanerozoic, for the Japanese the Mesozoic is the only era and all the other eras are flattened into it. It's still going on. The idiot Ian Scalloway is a peculiar looking man whose face is too white his eyebrows are too thick, his lips too thin, and his ears too big. Everything in Japan tastes of soy, sake, and vinegar, said the idiot, Ian Scalloway, but soy, sake, and vinegar have more tastes in them than we have in all our foods combined. I make a note of this. There are food printers in Japan. You never have to buy food. 
You just stand in your kitchen in front of a food printer and think of a dish and the machine, it has a sort of coloured bobbins on top and a big microwave oven below, prints the food, then bombards it with various cooking frequencies and it's served out the front. I ate very well in Japan, says the idiot Ian Scalloway. Rolling my sticky ball through the country, he continues, I collected many things. A PDF printout of a chunky cat, an origami tree, some crow droppings that smelt like elephant dung, a robot playing the shamisen, an unripe persimmon. I make a note of this too. It's certainly entertaining. Perhaps it will prove useful at some point.